All right, Judges chapter 20. We've got one more week. Next week we're finishing the book of Judges. And basically, Judges chapter 19, 20, and 21 are all related, all part of the same story. In Judges chapter 19, you have the abominable event that took place, uh, which we preached on last week. All of you probably remember that. In chapter 20, we've got the battle. And then chapter 21 is the aftermath, is just, just what happens. And after, as a result, you got the abomination, the battle, and then the aftermath. That's how chapters 19, 20, and 21 play out. So chapter 20, let's dig into this. We're going to look at this great battle of Israel coming out to, uh, to do justice and to stamp out the, the wicked children of Belial that, uh, that needed to be destroyed. Let's look at verse number one. The Bible says, And all the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was gathered together as one man, from Dan even to Beersheba, with the land of Gilead, unto the Lord in Mizpeh. And the chief of all the people, even of all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 footmen that drew swords. So basically, what it says, like, from Dan even to Beersheba, it's talking about throughout all Israel. So all of Israel... They're gathering together, and it says here that the chief of all the people, even of all the tribes, presented themselves. So these are the leaders, these are the people who are kind of in charge, running things in all of their local areas. They're the ones coming up to this battle. It says 400,000 footmen that drew sword. Now the children of Benjamin heard, verse 3, that the children of Israel were gone up to Mizpeh. Then said the children of Israel, tell us, how was this wickedness? So now they, they all gather together and saying, okay, Tell us the story. Tell us what happened. Because they had all gotten, if you remember from the last chapter, the, the pieces of this man's concubine were, were, were you know, he, he dismembered her and sent out to all the various tribes throughout Israel just because it was such a gruesome act and the people there were so wicked that he was just, just demonstrating you know what really happened there and just kind of driving that point home so they all show up and just like yeah we're not going to stand for this and then they all get there he's like okay now now tell us the story again what what actually happened here and it says in verse 4 and the levite the husband of the woman that was slain answered and said i came into gibeah that belonged to benjamin i and my concubine to lodge and the men of the gibeah then the men of gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about upon me by night and thought to have slain me and my concubine have they forced that she is dead. And I took my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, for they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. Notice here, he doesn't even get into all the details. He just says, they tried to kill me and they forced my concubine that she's dead. He didn't even get into, they tried to force me, they tr you know, all the other stuff that happened there. And he just gives them a real, a real short summary of everything that happened. And then, and then he turns around and he says in verse 7, Behold, ye are all children of Israel. Give here your advice and counsel. So he's basically saying, what, now what do you think we should do? Here's what happened. I came into town, me and my wife, we show up. And these people all just surrounded the house. And they tried to kill me. And they forced my wife and they killed her. And I cut her up and sent her out to you guys. Now tell me, what do you think we ought to do about this? Are we just going to stand by? What's your judgment? What do you think we should do about this? And notice, he puts it off himself. Obviously, he's real upset. This happened to him. But he's saying, you judge. Judge with yourself. Tell us. Tell me what we should do. Verse number eight, And all the people arose as one man, saying, We will not any of us go to his tent, neither will we any of us turn into his house. But now this shall be the thing which we will do to Gibeah. We will go up by lot against it. And we will take ten men of an hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel, and an hundred of a thousand, and a thousand out of ten thousand, to fetch victual for the people, that they may do when they come to Gibeah Benjamin according to all the folly that they have wrought in Israel. So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city knit together as one man. Now, uh, so basically what he says, they all answer saying that, well, we've all showed up here and we're going to take one-tenth of the people basically and get vittles and, and, and be, get the supplies for the 400,000 men that are there. And, and basically they're saying it doesn't matter how long it takes, we're going to be here 
and we're going to make sure that this job gets done, that, it's, that their wickedness is going to come back on their own heads and that they're going to take care of this problem. So he's saying, we're going to make sure we've got enough food. That's what vittles are, by the way. It's just, it's just food. It's your supplies. So they're going to make sure. Uh, that's why it says in, uh, in verse 10, we'll take 10 men of 100. So basically 10%, one out of 10. Throughout all the tribes of Israel, 100 of 1,000, 1,000 of 10,000, to fetch vittle for the people. So just to make sure that we all got supplies. Our 400,000 troops that are here are going to be supplied that they may do when they come to Gibeah Benjamin according to all the folly that they've wrought in Israel. So basically, is that they're going to do to them according to their own folly that they did. And they're going to, they're going to stamp them out. And what I, what I love about this passage here and what we see happening is, you know, in verse 1, in verse 8, in verse 11, three times it's mentioned that they came together as one man. You know, you may have a lot of differences with people. Maybe there were some differences between the tribes. May, you know, people might have been doing different things in different areas. But when something like this happens, they all come together as one man. They're just like, you know what? We're going to put our differences aside for a minute because this needs to be dealt with. And there's no question. There's no doubt about this. Verse number one says, you know, and the congregation was gathered together as one man from Dan even to Beersheba. Verse number eight says, and all the people arose as one man saying, we're not, any of us going to go to his tent, say, we're, we're not going to let this slide, we're not going to go home until this gets dealt with. And then in verse 11, it says, so all the men of Israel gathered against the city, knit together as one man. And even with all the problems that the children of Israel have had in their history throughout all this time, they haven't always been right with God, they haven't had the best spiritual walk. But you know what they knew, and you know what they all knew? That this is abomination, and this is going to be dealt with, and we are not going to tolerate this at all. As much other sin as maybe they've let slide, or they've been involved with themselves, they said, this is where we definitely draw the line, and we are stamping this out right now. And would to God that Christianity at large today, which could be represented here by the whole nation of Israel, by every single person, you know, every tribe, and that whole nation of Israel that were supposed to be children of God, they could at least all come together and just be like, yeah, that is wrong, and we're all going to come together as one man and just fight against this. And would to God that, that Christians, anyone who calls themselves a Christian out there, can recognize abomination when they see it and say, we're not going to stand for this. This is not acceptable. We're not going to tolerate this. We are going to be intolerant against sodomy, against homosexuality, against wickedness and perversion. That's right. That's right. That's right. We're not going to allow it. It's not acceptable. And no, in fact, we're not going to go home. We're going to make sure this gets dealt with right now. And we're going to stand side by side as one man and not allow this to happen. Not here, not anywhere. Amen. Not in our country. That's what they're saying. And we're gonna we're gonna take care of business. That's that's what Christianity needs today. But things have gotten so twisted and warped that you have professing Christians just sympathizing and, and tolerating and even in some cases promoting abomination and perversion sodomy, homosexuality. That's what I'm talking about, just in case you don't understand. You know, I'm talking about abomination. When I'm talking about wickedness, we're talking about the events that happened in this story where the men of the city, the children of Satan, showed up to, to sodomize the man that showed up, the strange man that just nobody knew, that they, they showed up to kill him and to force him and do just abominable things with him. And when they couldn't get him, they ended up forcing his wife and killing her because they're insatiable and wicked and ruthless and merciless. And read Romans 1 because that will describe what they're like. These people were resolved to not allow that to happen. Christians today need to get resolved and need to get founded and, and have a line. I mean, there's a lot of things that people can do that are wrong. You can have differences with a lot of people, but this is something that everyone ought to be able to agree on. See, we're not going to stand for this. And it, and it blows my mind how 
people cannot have at least that line drawn. And it's like, where is the line? Are you going to draw the line of pedophilia? Right. Well, guess what? It's the same line, my friends. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Bestiality? I mean, because here's the thing. If you want to use their arguments, well, love is love. Right. Well, you could use that argument with everything in the world. Yep. I love my coat rack. <laughs> I think I should be able to marry my coat rack. I think you need to recognize it. And don't say it, say her. <laughs> Use the right pronoun. That's offensive. My coat rack is going to sue you. This is the bizarre world that we live in today. But you can say, hey, love is love. That's what the pedophiles are already saying. They love those kids. It's disgusting, it's perverted, it's abominable. And we're not going to tolerate it. We shouldn't tolerate it. And you shouldn't tolerate the, the sodomy either. That, I mean, if you're going to profess to be a Christian, why don't you try reading the book? If you're going to say that you believe in Jesus Christ, why don't you try reading the book? Why don't you get what you believe from this book? And not from popular culture, and not from your stupid movie stars, and not from your music, and not from the television, but how about you read the Bible Amen. and get your beliefs from this book? Amen. And you tell me whether or not sodomy should be promoted and acceptable, and oh, we should just have a soft spot in our hearts for these poor little queers. For all their problems, you know, it's easy to go back and look at the children of Israel when they're coming out of Egypt, when they're wandering in the wilderness and go, how in the world could they do that? How, the same Christians that are going to mock the children of Israel and go, oh, they had no faith. They, you know, they got into all these problems. They, you know, they got into idolatry, got into all these other things. Hey, at least they knew what abomination is and they wouldn't stand for it when it came to this story. Yeah. I mean, they at least knew that much, which is way better than a lot of Christians today. Yeah. And it wasn't even a hesitation. It wasn't a thought. Notice, it doesn't say, well, they had to consult among each other and, and talk about it. They showed up and they're just like, we're not going home until this is dealt with. There was, there was no... No, the only counsel I think that's being given here is, well, how are we going to destroy them? That's the only thing that needs to be determined. They go to God and just make sure, hey, God, these are our brethren, right? They're, they're of the tribe of Benjamin. Should we, should we do this? God's like, yeah, yeah, go and do it. You're doing the right thing. Now, obviously, they were their physical brethren, but they weren't their spiritual brethren. Not the reprobates, at least. They didn't go soft. They didn't try to rehabilitate them. Oh, they're misunderstood. Oh, they had a bad upbringing. It was rough. Their dad grew up in the wilderness. You understand, their granddad. They had a hard time. No excuse. Some things you just can't fix. That which is crooked can't be made straight. That which the Lord has made crooked. When he gave them over to the reprobate mind. Let's keep reading here in Judges chapter 20. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says, And the tribes of Israel sent men through all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What wickedness is this that is done among you? So now they're sending messengers, and go, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to speak to Benjamin. Now, mind you, this event took place in Gibeah, and we're going to see that. But the whole tribe of Benjamin from that whole surrounding area, they all band together to defend these guys. This was just one city. This was not all of Benjamin in this one place. So they're trying to speak to, to Benjamin at large and say, what, what, what happened here, man? What kind of wickedness is going on in, in your state, right? So if you, if you think of like the tribes as, as states, 
And you have cities within the state. So like within Benjamin, like what is going, what is going on in there? What wickedness is this has done among you? Verse number 13. Now therefore deliver us the men, the children of Belial, which are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and put away evil from Israel. So they're saying, look, just give us these wicked guys, these, these wicked children of the devil. Give us the Sodomites that we could kill them. That's all we want. They didn't come to, to war against Benjamin as a whole. They came to do justice. They came to put those wicked men to death as, as rightfully ought to have been done according to God's law. And they're saying, we're just here to enforce the law. We cannot believe that this happened. This is insane, and they're going to die for it. It says, but the children of Benjamin would not hearken to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. But the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together out of the cities unto Gibeah to go out to battle against the children of Israel. So they dug in their heels. They said, no, we're not delivering anyone unto you. In fact, we're going to go and defend them. And I don't think that like all of Benjamin were reprobates. The people of Gibeah definitely were. These men of Gibeah, they were, they were filthy and wicked. But now you've got these sodomite sympathizers going to fight for them and to defend for them, which makes this situation way worse and causes a lot more destruction that didn't have to happen if they would have just recognized God's law and said, like, yeah, you're right. They're wicked. They deserve to die. But that's not what happened. They dig in their heels. It says um, in verse 15, and the children of Benjamin were numbered at that time out of the cities 20 and 6,000 men that drew sword beside the inhabitants of Gibeon, Gibeah, which were numbered 700 chosen men. So basically you had 700 men in Gibeah that they were looking to kill. Because these are the men that, that surrounded the house and we're trying to do those wicked things to the, to the man that showed up. And they ended up killing the guy's concubine. But 26,000 of Benjamin show up to their defense. Now, what's kind of interesting about that is out of the 26,000 men of Benjamin, there were 700 children of the devil, children of Belial. That 700, Gibeah, that's only 2.6% of the population in Benjamin. So I did the math on that. So it's a very, very small percentage of the Benjamites, just those 700 that were Sodomites. That need, but they all banded together. Now, that number sounds real familiar because I was, you know, I've always known that the, the Sodomite population is around 2 to 3%, just in general, at least it has been. But it prompted me to look up the statistics again. After, after looking at this story and kind of doing the math for myself. And I found that there was a Gallup poll done last year uh, showing that in the United States now, because the number has risen, and it's risen significantly in the United States, and, and the number that they're, uh, they're saying is 4.5% in the United States 4.5% of people are sodomites in the United States. That's almost double what we saw there in, in Gibeah and Saul, percentage-wise. I mean, think about how many more people is. I mean, that's 700 people. I mean, this is in the millions of people here that, that's at that 4.5%. Now, I don't know how accurate the Gallup polls are. But they, I read, I tried to read what, the, what they did. It was phone calls, and it was like somewhere close, I think 20,000 people they contacted. So it was a pretty decent-sized polling group, you know. It wasn't, it wasn't just some really small thing. It wasn't like a CNN poll, right? It wasn't, it wasn't one of those. But um, I have the numbers here. They, they posted these numbers of U.S. adults identifying as LGBT from 2012 to 2017. And the question was, do you personally identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender? That was, that's their, it's an it's a all-encompassing thing, which, go ahead, they, I don't care if they have all those different groups, it's all pervert. It's all sodomite. 
It doesn't matter if you're a bisexual sodomite or a lesbian sodomite or a gay sodomite or a transgender sodomite. The Bible's got one word for them. So that's, that's really, uh, so I'm glad they group it all together and don't split it out because then it's going to be harder to do all the math to make sure that, that you got it all covered, right? Throw them all together into one group because it, 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 they might as well be in one group. So in 2012, the, the number was 3.5% and then 3.6% the next year, 3.7% the next year, 3.9% the next year, 4.1% in 2016, and then 4.5% in 2017. And you say, it doesn't sound like a lot. Even those 0.1% is a lot of people. Like, that's a lot of growth, and especially if you figure the percentage increase when you're only talking about the number three, right? The percentage increase of even 0.1% Going up from three is, uh, um, what is that? All right, my mind just went blank. It's not that hard to figure out, but point 0.1, so think about uh, 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 one out of 35. What's the percentage of that? One in uh, 3%. 3%. It's a 3% increase just at that rate, and then you go from a point, that's a point 0.1 increase, going to a point 0.4 increase, you know, now you're, you're jumping up to almost 10%. Point 0.4 increase on a four number, that's 10%. 10% increase of that many more people. It's a lot in one year. Now, they attribute this to saying, well, the culture's being more accepting, which is true, the culture is becoming more accepting, and, and, and it's more tolerated and endorsed. It's, it's not just tolerated, it's endorsed. But see, I don't think that all of these numbers increasing is just because people are more willing to admit, because what they're trying to say is that, well, people now are, it's, it's not that there's more, it's just that they're, they're more willing to admit. But when they, when they covered the different groups, like even though we're in this supposedly really accepting uh, time era, the expansion, that rapid growth, is all from the younger generation. And to me, that just shows they're targeting the kids. Of course, these predators are targeting the children. They're targeting the younger generation. They're trying to groom them. And the more it's been tolerated, the more acceptable it is for these older sodomites to be in society, to go to church, to work in the nursery, to work with kids. They're getting more and more opportunities because, whoa, we can't discriminate against the sodomite. Now they're grooming. And, uh, and you know, grooming is, is a light way of saying they're defiling children. Right. But the reason why that word grooming is used is because they take time to build that relationship and try to build that trust before they go in and, and defile the child. It, this is serious, a serious mind game that goes on with these perverts to allow them to go undetected for so long because they instill a guilt in the child that they defile to not say anything. They try to make them feel guilty. They try to put the shame on them. Oh, you can't say, you know how your parents would feel about that if they knew you did that and just, and just automatically put it in their head like they're some willing participant in this thing just because they're little and they don't know what to do and they don't know, you know, like they just get totally taken advantage of. And these, and these perverted freaks go in and cause all kinds of damage. So that way, you know, these kids coming up they're getting it from, from all over the place, all in their, in their popular culture, saying not only is it acceptable, but it's cool. Right? Look at all these people. Look at all these rock stars that are all singing about it, and they're all coming out, and they're all, you know, I want to be like them. And this is why you see that increase. This article, because I, I got this all from an article from, um, from Gallup, it says the expansion in the number of Americans who identify as LGBT is driven primarily by the cohort of millennials, defined as those born between 1980 and 1999. The percentage of millennials who identify as LGBT expanded from 7.3% to 8.1% from 2016 
to 2017 and is up from 5.8% in 2012. 8.1%. I mean, and you wonder why we have a sn why everyone's calling the gen the millennials a snowflake generation? It's because all eight percent of them are sodomites. Eight. That's a lot. That's an inordinate amount. By contrast, the LGBT percentage in Generation X, those born from 1965 to 1979, was up only 0.2 percent from 2016 to 2017. There was no change last year in LGBT percentage among baby boomers born 1946 through 1964 and traditionalists born prior to 1946. So basically they're saying it's the younger generation. It's where all of that growth is what you're seeing is. And there's basically statistically nothing that relevant. I mean, the point, the point 0.2% is still kind of a lot, but that's, that's probably the younger end of that generation. I mean, that would be the only thing that would make sense. Obviously, going to taper off, but but they're saying that there is no change, though. Uh, you know, as you get older, it's just there's just no change. And what this also shows, though, is that it's not. This isn't just how people are born. If this, if that was just some some fact that well, there's just people are born this way. What would be the cause to have just so many more people now being born? that way just all of a sudden like what's what's the impetus for that what would cause that you'd think it would be a pretty fair constant if it was something naturally occurring that caused people to have perverted desires but it's not because it is directly influenced by the culture it's directly influenced by the wicked perverts that are trying to pervert other minds and trying to recruit people into that lifestyle. Or more appropriately called the death style, because that's what it is. It's disgusting to see this, and you know what? This is why I'm not going to shut up about it. Right. Ever. Amen. This, this needs to be preached and needs to be screamed about more and more and more. And you know what? I was encouraged when I got... Uh, word from other people around the state of Georgia saying, you know what, when they saw the news article, they saw the news story, we stand with you. There ought to have been a, a thousand times more. Yeah. Yeah. I got a few. And, you know, as I said before, I don't know if these guys were saved. I don't you know if so there's some different preachers or pastors or ministers or whatever they called themselves, these different churches. But hey, at least they knew <laughs> what the Bible says about sodomy and that it's not to be tolerated and praise God for him. But this is, I mean, this shouldn't even be a thought. And I'm not some big ecumenical guy. I don't think we should go and just, just start joining, making friends with everybody that just calls themselves a Christian. But you know what? I will stand next to anybody who's going to oppose this level of wickedness. I mean, I... Yeah, we're not going to stand for this. It shouldn't even be a question. We could come together as one man to, to, to squash abomination. Yeah. To stamp out pedophilia and sodomy and wickedness and weird perversion. Yeah. We, we shouldn't even have to think about joining together. You should just all stand up and do it. It's not a question of, oh, will you join with me? No, we're just going to go and take care of this. Everyone's going to take care of it. That's the, way it ought, that's the way it was here in this story. And that's the way it ought to be here with us today. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 16. The Bible says, Among all this people, there were 700 chosen men left-handed. Everyone could sling stones at a hairbreadth and not miss. So it said there, there's 700 men in Gibeah. And then it talks about these 700 men. I'm not for sure that this is the exact same 700 men, but it probably is. Um, that basically these guys were, were, were great warriors in the sense it says that they could sling stones at a hair breadth and not miss. So, you know, the, the, the length of a hair, the breadth of a hair, and just boom, they're right on target, right? So they're, they're really skilled at war. And the Bible talks and it brings up left-handed people a little bit in Scripture and makes a point to, to note of that. 
I don't think there's anything wrong with just being left-handed in general. I've got a couple of children that are left-handed, but I think the reason why it's brought up and the reason why there's a point made about it is that it is different. And these people are different. These people are not in their right mind. I mean, well, I guess they are if they're left-handed, right? But they're not, they're not right. Okay, they're, they're different. They're not like everybody else. These people are weird. And, and these people are children of the devil and they're perverts. Okay. Um, I, other than that, I don't think there's, you know, obviously it's not a sin to be left-handed or anything like that. You don't have to force yourself to be right-handed. If, you, if you're born left-handed, that's not, that's not the point of bringing that up. But let's keep reading here. Verse number 17, the Bible says, The men of Israel beside Benjamin were numbered 400,000 men that drew sword. All these were men of war. And the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God and said, Which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. So the battle gets set. 400,000 troops versus 26,700. It's stacked. It's stacked for the people doing the right thing. Israel goes and gets counsel from God. They're doing all of the right things. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? Let's see how day one goes. The Bible says in, in verse number 20, And the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin, and the men of Israel put themselves in array to fight against them at Gibeah. And the children of Benjamin came. Forth out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground of the Israelites that day, 20 and 2,000 men. So day number one, battle doesn't go so good for Israel. 22,000 men. That's a, that's a lot of people to lose. Out of that, even just out of 400,000, 22,000 guys died. And they're fighting against 26,700. So it's like the children of Benjamin, they all killed one person and they didn't, they didn't die themselves, basically. I mean, we don't see the exact case. It doesn't give you uh, numbers on the other side, but we can assume that, that none of them died here. So they asked God again, you know, if they should fight, if they're doing the right thing. Verse 22 says, and the people... The men of Israel encouraged themselves and set their battle again in array in the place where they put themselves in array the first day. And the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until even and asked counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up again to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the Lord said, Go up against him. So now they're saying, you know, God, they encouraged themselves. They got themselves ready to fight again, right? It was a, it was a bad loss, but they're ready to keep fighting. And, and they're weeping before God and say, God, you know, should we go up against my brother? Is this right? Do you want us doing this? And they keep going back to God and God says, go up against him. Yes. Keep fighting. Day two, verse 24. And the children of Israel came near against the children of Benjamin the second day. And Benjamin went forth against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed down to the ground of the children of Israel again. 18,000 men, all these drew the sword. So day two, Israel loses 18,000 men. So they weep and they fast and they consult with God again. Look at verse number 26. The Bible says, Then all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came unto the house of God and wept and sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until even and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord... <laughs> For the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin and my brother, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into thine hand. They lost 40,000 men at this point out of 400,000. That's one out of 10 guys died fighting this battle. And I think what this story demonstrates is now, of course, they're going to go and they're going to beat him and we're going to read how they, how they destroy him. But that third day, God's just like, all right, I'm going to deliver him into your hand now. But they were, they were doing what was right the whole time. And you can see how after each loss, they're asking the question, you know, they're, they're fasting, they're doing everything that they're supposed to be doing, but then going back to God, God, should we be doing this? I mean, I just lost, <coughs> Right? We know that we need to have faith in God to win our battles for us and to win our victories for us. So when you lose, 
especially when you're doing the right things. It's not like they didn't see counsel of God. They did see counsel of God. They're fasting. They're humbling themselves. They're going before God and they're doing the right thing. They are doing the right thing. But it causes you to question, are we doing the right thing? Because they're suffering such a great loss. And they shouldn't be suffering a great loss, especially when you think about just logistically speaking. I mean, 400,000 against 26,000. They shouldn't be losing. They should be winning. They're doing the right thing. How does this happen? Well, I think what this is demonstrating to us is that sometimes there are battles that are going to require sacrifice. And this is a serious battle. This, I mean, this is a very important battle. This is one that you have to be dedicated to be fighting against until death. I mean, this is that serious. This is just something that you can't just let this go. And you know what? The enemy, they will be strong. Now, we know that if God be for us, who could be against us in the end? But we also know that as believers... Not every single fight is going to be a victory. And there's going to be persecutions. There's going to be tribulation. And in fact, in the end times, there's going to be people martyred and put to death for the cause of Christ. And you look at all the disciples of Jesus, almost all of them were martyred. They were, they were killed in, in not very pleasant ways. They were tortured. They had all kinds of things happen against them. So when people who are doing God's work and fighting the battles of the Lord, you got to be prepared to suffer defeat. But you have to be resolved to say, we're not going to back down. We're not going to stop. We're not going to quit. Yeah, you know what? We're suffering loss here. 40,000 men gave their lives. But they're doing the right thing, and you can't back down from that. You may suffer defeats. The opposition can be strong. But you can't give up the fight against the abominable. When you give up, you lose. And that's the bottom line. I mean, imagine them just saying, well, we're not really making a dent here. They're too strong for us, so we give up. No, and, God, and God might have just been testing them too to make sure their heart is right. And it was. And then God, finally, God said, you know what? I'm going to deliver them in your hand. And it was that perseverance that, that pays off here. The Bible says here in uh, verse number 29, it says, And Israel set liars in wait round about Gibeah. And the children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day and put themselves in array against Gibeah as at other times. And the children of Benjamin went out against the people and were drawn away from the city, and they began to smite of the people and kill as at other times in the highways of which one goeth up to the house of God and the other to Gibeah in the field about 30 men of Israel. And the children of Benjamin said, they are smitten down before us as at the first. But the children of Israel said, let us flee and draw them from the city unto the highway. So basically, they set the battle up again as they have been doing the past couple days. Children of Benjamin come out to fight. They kill about 30 people. And basically, they're playing it out to look like the same thing that's happened the first two days is going to happen again. But see, this time, the children of Israel set people to, to lie in wait or to ambush the city. And, and so they split up some of their troops. And the children of Benjamin didn't know about it. So they were hiding and waiting. So what the children of Israel did is say, okay, well, we're going to retreat. We're going to, we're going to draw them away from their city because they're, they're right up against the city of Gibeah. They're, they're defending their stronghold. They're defending their city, Right. So they're, they're not going to go too far from it. But because they've been beating them the first two days, they're confident now of just going, man, we've got these guys licked. You know, we, we got their number. They killed 40,000 people the first two days. So they're willing to chase after them now as the children of Israel start to retreat. So they're going after them. Well, this was planned out. Because after they get far enough away, then the people who are surrounding the city that were lying in wait, they get up, they go into the city, and they kill everyone that's left in that city. And then they, they burn it, they start it on fire, and then they come out to basically meet the, other, you know, meet the people in the battle 
So now the children of Benjamin are just surrounded by the children of Israel and they're getting, they're getting, they don't know what's hitting them now because they got the fight on all, on all sides of them. So let's read about that here. The Bible says, um, verse 33, And all the men of Israel rose up out of their place and put themselves in array at Baal Tamar. And the liars in wait of Israel came forth out of their places, even out of the meadows of Gibeah. And there came against Gibeah 10,000 chosen men out of all Israel. And the battle was sore, but they knew not that evil was near them. And the Lord smote Benjamin before Israel. And the children of Israel destroyed of the Benjamin, Benjamites that day twenty and five thousand and an hundred men. All these drew the sword. So now this was a, a huge loss for Benjamin. This is basically a total loss. Twenty five thousand and one hundred. They started with twenty six thousand and seven hundred. So they, you know, they were left with what sixteen hundred people or twenty six hundred people, whatever. There was, um, forgive my math again. Hardly anybody was left over out of that battle. It was a huge, huge loss. I mean, they killed almost all of them. Uh, it says here in verse number thirty six. So the children of Benjamin saw that they were smitten. For the men of Israel gave place to the Benjamites because they trusted under the liars in wait, which they had set beside Gibeah. And the liars in wait hasted and rushed upon Gibeah. And the liars in wait drew themselves along and smote all the city with the edge of the sword. Now there was an appointed sign between the men of Israel and the liars in wait that they should make a great flame with smoke rise up out of the city. And when the men of Israel retired in the battle... Benjamin began to smite and kill of the men of Israel about 30 persons, for they said, Surely they are smitten down before us as in the first battle. But when the flame began to arise up out of the city with a pillar of smoke, the Benjamites looked behind them, and behold, the flame of the city ascended up to heaven. And when the men of Israel turned again, the men of Benjamin were amazed, for they saw that evil was come upon them. Therefore they turned their backs before the men of Israel unto the way of the wilderness, but the battle overtook them, and them which came out of the cities, they destroyed in the midst of them. So basically, children of Israel are running away as Benjamin's pursuing them until they see the smoke come up out of the city. Then they turn around because Benjamin, they're like, whoa, you know, like, they're, <laughs> that's, that's their base. I mean, that's, that is their struggle. They've got nowhere to go now. They have nowhere to retreat. The people were in there that were killed. Because there was 10,000 soldiers that went in and they raised the city and they killed everyone in there with the sword and they start that city burning on fire. So now they realize, you know, there's no way out for them to the point where they're turning their backs in the battle. Well, when you turn your back in the battle, you're going to start getting defeated heavily. And that's what happened there. And then, of course, they, you know, the, the people who were in, went into the city, started on fire, they came out to meet them all and it was a, a slaughter. Bible says in verse number 43, Thus they enclosed the Benjamites round about and chased them and trod them down with ease over against Gibeah toward the sun rising. And there fell of Benjamin 18,000 men. All these were men of valor. And they turned and fled toward the wilderness unto the rock of Rimmon. And they gleaned of them in the highways 5,000 men and pursued hard after them unto Gidom and slew 2,000 men of them. So at the, the other verse that so we read, gave the, the, the total for the day or for that battle. Now we're seeing the breakdown of, of how many people died at each point, right? So of the 22,000 or however many uh, the Bible said before died, it was 18,000 basically died right there at, that, at, at the main battle. And then as they fled, they get to the Rock Rimmon and um, 5,000 more died in the highway on the way there and pursued out after them unto guide them and slew 2,000 there. So it was 18,000 plus the five plus the two. So that with all which fell that day of Benjamin were 20 and 5,000 men that drew the sword. All these were men of valor, but 600 men turned and fled to the wilderness under the rock rim and abode in the rock rim in four months. And the men of Israel turned again upon the children of Benjamin and smote them with the edge of the sword as well. The men of every city as the beast and all that came to hand, also they set on fire all the cities that they came to. So now they're just finishing off the job basically in Benjamin and doing what God's law prescribed to do unto the children of, of Belial. 
which is what we read that last week. We went, oh, I'm not going to go over it again. But basically, he says, hey, if people come unto you and say, let us go worship another god that your fathers haven't worshipped, you know, and, and if this is happening in a city, you make diligent inquiry, is this really happening? And if it be so, then you, you kill them all and you burn the city to the ground. And that's what they're doing here. <coughs> and they did. They made inquiry and they went there and said, what wickedness was this done among you? And when they had a chance to deliver the actual evildoers, they all banded together. Okay, well, now you're all going to suffer the same, the same fate. And beware, you know, Christian that wants to, to take the side of the abominable, take the side of the God-hater. I wouldn't want to be yoked up with people that hate God because when, when, that, when that judgment does come, because the judgment will come, you don't want to be the collateral damage that, that goes down with the perverts. You end up fighting with the people who hate God. You're fighting against God. I don't want to be someone fighting against God. I, I'm going to be fighting for God, not against God. And it, it's, it's, so, it's so simple. You'd think it would be so simple. Where, where, are, where is morality today? The mo one of the most basic things just in nature. I didn't have to have anybody teach me when I was a kid growing up that it was disgusting, weird, wrong to have men with men and women with women. When I was growing up, there was name calling going on calling people fags. Why? Because that's not something anyone wants to be called. Why? Because you don't even have to be taught as a child that that's wrong because it's just weird. Because if you ever saw anyone doing anything like that, you would practically throw up or throw up in your mouth and say, what was that? Because that's a normal response. Because it's so unnatural and, and bizarre. And people today have just been so desensitized because they love the stinking television and they love the filth that gets promoted and the things they like, well, they, they, they tolerate the stuff they don't like <coughs> and allow themselves to keep seeing it over and over enough to make it not bother you so much. And look, I know this happens. I used to watch all the movies that came out. And it got to the point where I recognized, after I started to hear some real Bible preaching, how far I had slipped in my mind as far as how bad sin really is. Because oh, when all you do is put sin in front of your face, it becomes normalized. Because normal is all just, just relative to whatever your standard is. Right? So what, what's normal? Well, what's normal today wasn't normal 20 years ago. But see, our, our standard of normal should come from Scripture. Because this doesn't change. So what's normal in the Bible now has always been normal. According to this rule, according to this standard. What's normal in our culture has gone all over the place. And what's normal in your life is what you're surrounding yourself with. And that's why people today, and, and in that same article, I didn't, I didn't print this. But I've seen this before. You can see, this is obvious. You could ask anybody. And when people are interviewed or just asked questions, when they're polled and they're asked, how many sodomites, how many LGBT people are there? Give a percentage. They always weigh inflate the number. They always say it's a lot more than it actually is. And this was saying, even going back to you know, 30 or 40 years ago or however long they started to like pull these, these types of statistics, that it's always been higher, but now it's like way higher because people used to say like 10% or 15% or something like that. And now they're saying like 30%, 35%. Yeah, one in three, really. You know why? Because at least one in three of your actors and, and music musicians at least are publicly sodomites. Right. So when that's what you're seeing all the time and you're watching these shows and you're, and you're just, this is what's coming, that's going to be your worldview. You're going to think, well, yeah, there's just, I mean, they're all over the place. No, they're still not. 
Four and a half percent. That's pretty high. But it's four and a half percent. It's not 20 percent. It's not 30 percent. That's a huge difference. They're not all over the place. Maybe that should make you think a little bit. Well, maybe there's an agenda now behind all of the filth on TV. If, if they're just going to keep pumping this and showing this to you with every show, every movie, you think there might be an agenda? I don't know. It's obvious. Pull your head out of the sand and put your head into this book. Get yourself normal to the right standard. And then this filth won't even be a question as to whether or not something should be done about it and people should stand up and people should actually care enough to draw a line in the sand and say, no, this is not acceptable. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear teaching from your words. We thank you for your wholesome words, Lord, that um, they'll help us to learn and to grow. I pray that you would please help us to not just ignore these, uh, these stories in Scripture, especially when we see essentially the same story repeated twice in, from Genesis 19 and Judges 19. And um, help us to, to understand the world that we live in Understand the way that you would have us to live in this world, Lord, and help us to uh, stay off the evil and to stand up for what's right. God, strengthen us, encourage us, and uh, help us to, to know and to do what's right. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.